morning, everyone. If you're able, stand and sing with me. Uh, morning has broken. One of those old hymns we don't sing very often. And all of God's people said, Amen, and sat down. <laughs> so good to see everybody. And our prayers are with our folks over at the Can retreat. Sorry, Jeff, I can't hear you. you can't hear? Yeah. Roger? Can you hear me up there? Yeah. Now? <laughs> Thumbs up. Good. We uh, just want to welcome everybody this morning, especially those that are joining us on the airwaves. And uh, we just trust that with the change in the weather, wasn't it great? Yes. All right. It's been so hot and so humid. And now we're going to be able to enjoy at least a few days of uh, really nice weather. That's the reason I wanted to open with that uh, particular song this morning. So, uh, God bless you. I want to uh, just take a quick look at our uh, announcements for today. And there are plenty, believe me. Number one, the uh, church council and board meetings uh, on Tuesday, August 16th. And then on the 19th, uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening, we'll be setting up for the block party, which follows the next day from noon to 3 p.m., where the out, uh, focus will be on community outreach, a block party. Volunteers are needed for kitchen and games. We're going to have hot dogs, popcorn, and inside and outside games for the community. And uh, then on uh, next Sunday, the 21st will be our tailgate lunch after the 11 o'clock service. Normally this is the second Sunday, but because of the retreat, it was postponed one week. And then of course, the August 27th Montgomery Family Concert. Any other announcements that we need to address this morning? If not, I'd like to begin first with prayer and then a scripture lesson. Almighty God, we so earnestly lift up your name above all names. We thank you, Father, for all of our blessings, 
But we thank you especially for the sweet fellowship that holds Emmanuel Baptist Church together this day. We thank you for everything, and we confess, Heavenly Father, that sometimes our works for you fall a little short. But surely, Lord, you make up for any mistakes that we make if we put our faith and our trust in you. So, Lord, we lift up the members of this church. There are many requests this day for prayer, those who are sick this day, those who are recovering, those who are looking forward to operations this week. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be with each and every one who need you so desperately. So now, Lord, as we continue in our worship this morning, help us and guide us and give us the true meaning of your wonderful words to us as they come to us from Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. These words from Philippians, the second chapter, beginning with verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this leads us into our name of Jesus Medley. These, there is no name above the name of Jesus. And as Mark comes to lead us, we'll be singing, first, his name is wonderful. There's something about that name. And then, blessed be the name of the Lord. Mark. Thank you. 
Shall we pray? Almighty God, from whom we not only profit, but we are just overwhelmed with the love that you show to us each and every day. And Lord, part of our responsibility as the people of God is to return just a small portion of what you have given to us as we give our tithes and our offerings this day. Thank you again, Father, for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated.
Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. Everything is beautiful in its own way, especially the music we love, right? Hope you enjoyed our little medley this morning. There is no greater name than the name of Jesus. I'd like to uh, begin this morning by turning to Genesis chapter 3, all the way back in the very first book of the Bible. Genesis 3, beginning with verse 1, the fall of man. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. May God richly bless this reading from His Holy Word. Everybody hearing okay now? Good. We all know that when life began here on planet Earth, that Adam and Eve just totally had it made, didn't they? Perfect health, perfect weather, best food ever. But what happened? Sin got a hold of man and womankind and hasn't let go since. So a question for you this morning. By a showing of your hands, who thinks that Eve was to blame for the first sin? Nobody? Nobody's to blame. <laughs> okay, let's have a showing of hands then who think Adam was the culprit. Anybody vote for Adam? <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> now who thinks that the culprit was that snake in the grass? Look at all these hands going up. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Uh, I guess you could sort of say the snake was. He was the one that made the approach, wasn't he? Already an instrument, though, of the devil, who is the author of all sin. So here was this miserable snake in the grass, beautiful at that point, but later God made him crawl on his stomach. There's, there's only one animal, really, I don't mind doing away with, and that's a snake. I don't know. There's just something about it that makes you want to get a hoe and start, start chasing it. Or a lawnmower, maybe. <laughs> I believe that both Adam and Eve can share the blame, along with the snake, for the first sin. And a lot of people worry about that first sin. 
Why would they mess everything up by sinning there in that perfect place called the Garden of Eden? You've heard the expression, don't mess with perfection. Well, they did mess with perfection, and we've been paying the price ever since. But who can say that he or she would have handled it any different had we been in the place of Adam and Eve? I think Adam and Eve just happened to be not only the luckiest, but also the unluckiest people ever born. Everything was going along perfectly until this serpent made a proposition to Eve. Now, why would he approach a woman first? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's pretty good evidence that women have always made the major decisions in most of our families. You know, men, we decide whether we ought to go to war or send somebody on toward Mars to look it over before the rest of us make a trip up there perhaps sometime. But then we have the woman. She decides the, the smaller issues of life. You know, like, should we buy or build a house? Should we buy a car, Linda? <laughs> Things like that. But the serpent here raised a question with Eve about the goodness of God. Why would God refuse her and Adam the privilege of anything in the garden, especially something that must be the most desirable of all? God tells you to keep away from this fruit because He knows you will become equal with Him if you eat it, the serpent said. And without much thought, Eve bit. I mean, literally. And of course, she wanted her husband to sample the fruit too. So he took a bite. And that was the first sin. But it was also the first time that man or woman had ever made a choice. And God is so wonderful that He gives us a choice. You know, He could have just created a whole earth full of little robotic people who only knew and did good. But in His infinite wisdom, and love for us. He wanted us to love Him because we wanted to, not because we had no other choice. So these first two were given a choice, just as today we're all given a choice between good and evil. In our daily routines, or just about anything, we're all susceptible to making the choices of life. And He's always given us the choice between good and evil. I, for one, don't put all the blame on Adam and Eve. Any one of us, by accident of birth, could have been the culprit that committed that first sin, wanting to be equal with God. But this morning, for some reason, I'm more worried about the second sin than I am the first sin, because we will never recover from the first sin as long as we're guilty of the second. God's provided a remedy for the first, and we know what that is, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and trusting Him. But the second sin can rem re render God's remedy for the first totally ineffective. That's why the second sin worries me so very much. 
we might even classify this second sin as what we refer to as the unpardonable sin. For centuries, people have discussed, sometimes quite heatedly, what the unpardonable sin is. Let's, but let's go back to this Genesis story to explore what that second sin is. After Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit, they became ashamed of their nakedness. But more important, they became uneasy with the God who made them. So when God came walking in the garden, they tried to hide. They must have realized it's impossible to hide from God. But sin makes us do irrational things. Don't you know that? Sin never comes off looking smart, no matter how you dress it up. As they say, it's sort of like putting lipstick on a pig. We talk a lot about confessing our sins. Catholics even have a confessional booth that they can go to. But God already knows what they're going to confess. Maybe the priest doesn't. He's supposed to be the Mr. Interlocutor. But the problem is that God already knows. He knows what we're going to do, past, present, and future. So in reality, instead of confessing our sins, we're not doing that at all. He already knows what they are. What we're really doing is acknowledging our sin. We know that we have sinned God. So although He already knows it, we are acknowledging sin when we pray. Why are you so hiding, God asked. And Adam, who's been very quiet up to this point, says, I heard you coming, and I didn't want you to see me naked. So I hid. Who told you you were naked, God asked. Have you eaten fruit from the tree I warned you about? Yes, Adam admits. But it was the woman who gave me, who brought me some, and I ate it. And Eve, not wanting to be the only one on the receiving end of God's wrath, said, The serpent tricked me. And therein lies the second sin I've been talking about. More dangerous even than the first because it prevents us, it prevents us from recovering from the first sin. The second sin is the sin of excuses, passing the buck, our total unwillingness to admit we're wrong and the refusal to see ourselves for what we really are, just plain old bald-faced liars. Whatever your sin might be, lying, adultery, cheating, bad temper, gluttony, drunkenness, gossip, murder, there is always hope for you. But when we become guilty of the second sin, the sin of always excusing ourselves and of being unwilling to face the facts, this slams the door shut against God. The world stands or falls on its readiness to repent, which is simply acknowledging our wrong and turning away from it. And this is true of nations, of institutions or individuals. If a nation takes a wrong turn and repents, she can recover. But if she insists on justifying whatever she's done, she will disintegrate. The prophets called it the judgment of God, but it's written into the very nature of the universe. Either we face our mistakes and repent or our world comes crashing down around us. The same thing goes for institutions from the church right on down. When it was revealed several years ago that a national charitable organization was paying exorbitant salaries 
to a few top officers and that the rest of the money was being squandered, the organization faced a choice. It could either tough it out and take the consequences or it could admit the error of its ways. It chose to confess its sins and that institution survived. As far as individuals, Fiorello LaGuardia, who had an, an airport and a musical play named after him, was mayor of New York back in the late 30s and early 40s. And what made him so popular was that when he made a mistake, he admitted it. Can you imagine that, admitting a mistake? He said one time that he didn't make a lot of mistakes, but when I do, it's a beaut. He got votes because he knew enough to acknowledge when he was wrong. Mistakes don't always destroy us. And if we're smart, we can even learn to be stronger as a result of them. What destroys us is our inability to face ourselves and confess that we have been wrong. All the people we read about in the Bible can be divided into two different categories. Those who fouled up and repented and those who did not. Moses and Balaam both erred, but Moses repented his way to greatness while Balaam died a fool. King Saul and King David were both sinners, but Saul met a tragic end, while David wound up being declared a person after God's own heart. I've referred to this second sin as perhaps the unpardonable sin, the one defined as the sin against the Holy Spirit in Mark 3.28, a blaspheming of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, of course, is that part of the Trinity who convicts us of our sins. And when we excuse ourselves and refuse to recognize our sins, we harden our hearts toward the Holy Spirit a little bit more every time we do that. And if this hardening or rejecting continues long enough, we come to the place where we no longer hear or have a sense of the Spirit's calling. Oh, He's still calling all right. I think that God always calls His people. He wants us to come back to Him. He created each and every one of us for a purpose, and we've explored that at other times. So we're all down here for a purpose. The only way we can lose God is to just keep saying, no, no, no. At a later date, perhaps, I may consider salvation as my only hope. But right now, I'm not ready. That's a famous, famous phrase from people who keep rejecting over and over the wonderful gift of salvation. But eventually, if they say no long enough, that calling is going to become so faint that they no longer hear it. And that's so sad. Adam and Eve set the pattern for us. And we've been perfecting the art of making excuses ever since. Adam could have stepped forward and confessed to God what had happened. And as I said, God already knew about it anyway. But he pointed his finger at Eve and said, it was the woman. What a courageous thing for the man of the house to do. And Eve did the same. She blamed the snake. 
There are a lot of differences between males and females. And just as an aside, I would say, viva la différence. <laughs> we like our roles as men and women, don't we? But they have one thing in common, sin. We all sin in the sight of God. We all have the flaw of looking for ways to blame something or somebody else for all of our mistakes. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Adam didn't just blame the woman, he also blamed God. It was that woman you gave me, he said. In other words, it's your fault for giving her to me. I hope there are no men or women here today blaming God for giving them their chosen spouse. But we do blame God for things sometimes, don't we? It's that temper you gave me, God. I just can't seem to help myself. Or it's in my genes. Or God, you should have given me more talent. I just can't seem to do anything. We even list the help of psychologists and psychiatrists in blaming other people. These people are experts at explaining why you feel so much guilt. And together they look for some fault in our genetic code, perhaps, to prove that we're really not responsible for what we do. The problem is we really are responsible for our own sins. If we could be responsible for other people's sins, wouldn't it be wonderful? Think of all the mothers who are up past midnight praying for their kids out there running the roads half drunk. If those mothers could just be saved for their children, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But we have to be responsible for our own mistakes. The ultimate tragedy of this second sin is that it prevents us from finding God. As Psalm 51 says, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. If we're truly sorry for our sins and don't make excuses and blame it on everybody and everything else, God can come into our hearts. But God is shut out of our life if we fail and become a victim of these hard shell excuses that some of us are so familiar with. Whatever sin or weakness we might have, God has the remedy. Only one thing can prevent our getting well, only one, the second sin, our total unwillingness to acknowledge that we need help. Whatever we do with this life, whatever course we take, let's be sure we don't go to our grave making excuses. Let's not break God's heart by refusing His greatest gift of all, allowing His Son to come and take upon his back the sins of us all who admit, who acknowledge, who don't make excuses, admitting those shortcomings and receiving the free gift of salvation. God bless you. I hope that this message this morning has been enough to make you at least thoughtful about giving too many excuses. There are legitimate excuses. Maybe the other guy did do it. But uh, why not take those sins that he did against you and love him instead of trying to bring the wrath of the Lord down upon him? We can either go to the foot of the cross and praise our Lord Jesus Christ for the wonderful gift of salvation that He offers us, or we can just continually blame people for our mistakes.
the ultimate result, losing contact with the very one who made us. We're going to sing a uh, hymn of invitation at this time. Please stand if you will. If there's any decision that you need to make, or if you'd like to talk to me about anything that I've said today, uh, just stick around after the service. I see some able to rise. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Let's join them, if you will. Thank you for your kind attention this morning, and I'm going to reward you for that. You get to race with all the Methodists and Presbyterians to your favorite restaurant today. <laughs> and since I'm letting you go a few minutes early, you might be the first in line. Isn't that wonderful? I borrowed those little jokes from Grady Nutt. Anybody remember Grady Nutt? He was the best Christian.